And I want to begin these lectures by talking about fallen, what it means to have a failure in your life. But one man, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, has written these words. He said, my conviction is that failure of some kind is common to all of us. And since God had people like us in mind when Christ died, God's grace is adequate to make the best of any situation. The danger then is not that we would fall, because everybody's going to fall at some point, but the danger is that you fall and you stay on the ground. And that's the problem that we face today, is that Christians, and especially Christian leaders, have a fall and they stay on the ground. And I know personally that the landscape is littered with fallen soldiers who need to get back up, get in the battle for the Lord, but no one is helping them get back up. And there they stay on the ground, defeated, and they're overwhelmed by their guilt, they're overwhelmed, overwhelmed by shame of what they have done, and they don't believe that God could ever forgive them or use them again. And Satan reinforces that feeling to them. And sometimes he uses people, even other Christian people, to keep them on the ground. And in my way of thinking, that's one of the great tragedies in the Christian world today of wounded soldiers who have never been healed and never gotten back into the battle because God's people have never used the truth of God's word filled with grace to get them restored and back into the game. There's a desperate, desperate need for churches to practice biblical church discipline and biblical restoration. And I, I believe that there's gonna be a growing need for this. The need is already huge. And I, I'm exposed to that because I'm in contact with so many uh, leaders and just by the nature of my ministry. Uh, but I know that the, the need is growing. Almost every day I hear about it. There are about, in the United States, there are about 1,500 pastors a month that leave the ministry for a variety of reasons, not all because of moral failures or ethical failures, but many of them uh, for that reason. But the church doesn't know what to do. I want to tell you two stories. I want us, want us to demonstrate what we're talking about. One story that I will tell you is where grace was not demonstrated. The other story where grace and truth came together and restored someone. But it's about two individuals, Joe and Becky, and they went separate ways. Joe uh, accepted Christ when he was a teenager. He loved the Lord. He married a wonderful Christian woman. He prepared himself for ministry, and he was on the staff of a large church, a mega church. And his position was the executive pastor of that church. And he was one that over, he oversaw the affairs of the church. And he was one that effectively kept the church functioning, and the church was thriving. It was a wonderful church, and the finances were healthy in the church, and Joe was happy. Life was good, but there was one area of his life that he wasn't real happy with. That was his financial package. He knew the church had plenty of money, but his salary was, uh, he felt, not adequate, and he approached the church board and, and told them that he needed a needed a raise in, the, in his salary. And he asked uh, them for that several times and it was refused. So Joe began to rationalize, I'm the guy that's making this church go. And I know what the finances are like. The church is in good fiscal shape. And I know the hours that I put in. And I know I'm not adequately compensated for that. And because he was the executive pastor and knew about the finances, he developed a scheme whereby he could take some money 
from the offerings to supplement his inadequate salary. And he felt justified in doing it. He rationalized in his own mind. The bookkeeper found out. It was discovered what he was doing. There was a meeting called of the church elders. He was called in and he was brutalized by them. They said, Joe, we trusted you. We thought you were a man of God. You acted like this. You broke our trust. You clean out your desk right now and we don't want you to ever attend this church again. You're not welcome to step a foot on the church property. You're out of here. You're gone. And Joe walked out of the office, his mind just in a whirl, his stomach churning. How would he explain this to his wife? The shame and the guilt began to just come on him, what he had done. He went home, he didn't sleep that night. He just laid there thinking, what, I've ruined everything. How will I explain this to my family? The next morning, he got the courage up to talk to his wife and told her what had happened. She said, I'll stand with you, I'll support you, we'll work this out together. And Joe spent the next couple of days repenting, confessing, praying, asking God to help him to work this through. And after a few days, he called the church chairman and he said, I would like to meet with the board again. I would like to confess. I'm not asking for my job back. I just want to tell them how sorry I am and that I want to make restitution. I want to pay back every dime that I have taken. And the chairman of the board says, no, you can't do that. We've moved away from that. You're done. You're finished. We don't want to hear from you anymore. End of story. And he hung up on him. And Joe was devastated. Joe and his wife, Alicia, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to turn. They dropped out of church for a while. They just wandered around. They felt guilty. No one reached out to help them. No one tried to encourage them. Nobody showed the grace of God to them. And not only that, it was for years that they went that way before they ever got back in fellowship with God through some grace-filled people. But the church did not prosper either. And that's an important point. That church sang about grace, they talked about grace, they preached about grace, but they had no idea of how to show grace to a fallen brother. And that church, the finances began to decrease, the attendance decreased, and the glory of God went away from that church. And I know church after church that that's happened to. That's Joe. Let me tell you about Becky. Joe, no grace was demonstrated. In Becky's case, grace was demonstrated. And the outcome was totally different. But Becky and her husband, Mark, were very involved in the church. Let's call it First Church. They were involved, they sang in the choir, her husband uh, ushered, they took care of the children, they were in Bible study, they were very active members. But Mark was a very busy guy. He was in the computer business, he had to work long hours, and he was neglecting his family, neglecting his wife, and she was feeling neglected, overwhelmed with her responsibilities as a mother with a kid, so she started taking a break and going out in the evening. Well, one day she announced to her husband that she was leaving him and leaving the children, and that she was moving in with another woman who had become her lover. You can imagine the shock waves for her husband, Mark, and for the whole church body absolute devastation. They tried to contact her and reason with her, but she refused. The pastor called her and went after her and tried to show her love and grace, and she refused. The church gathered and they prayed for her. They, her husband prayed for her. The children prayed for her. 
Months went by. One night she called up her husband and she said, I have been a fool. I can't believe what I've done. Do you think you could ever find it in your heart to forgive me? And her husband extended grace to her. And he said, we need to go and we need to talk to the pastor. She said, no, I don't want to go. She said, they won't want to see me after what I've done. The shame, the guilt was there. But he convinced her to go. They went to the pastor's office, sitting outside the office, waiting for the pastor, and she was so nervous. What's he going to say? What's he going to do? How is he going to just blast me for what I did? He opened the door and he walked out and he said, Becky, welcome home. I put his arms around her and gave her a hug. And he said, Becky, this will work. If you're really repentant, he said, we're here to help you. We want to see you restored to Mark, to our church body. And that church began a restoration process for her. And she was completely restored. And their marriage became more authentic than ever, deeper and healthier and better than ever. And the church showed grace and they understood what grace was all about. And God's blessing was on that church. And that church began to prosper and grow. Not because they took sin lightly, not because they showed cheap grace like some people might experience, no. Not at all. They had excommunicated her, actually, when she refused uh, their overtures. When they tried to reach out to her, over a period of time, they had to remove her from the church rolls, which they did. But the minute she repented, and there was brokenness there, they embraced her. They lavished grace upon her and assured her of their love and of God's love and grace. And she became whole. Their marriage was stronger. God blessed that church. And that church became known as a safe place, as a place where grace was not only sung about, not only talked about, not only preached about from the pulpit, but the grace that was shown consistently with no compromise in God's truth. Truth and grace won the day. It will always win the day if we keep those two in balance for the glory of God. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com.